Hello, and a very warm welcome to the splendid surroundings of the Victoria Wood Hall here at Halle St. Peter's in Northern Manchester. I'm Henry Little, I'm the Chief Executive of Operara, and it's a huge pleasure to welcome you to this discussion about our studio recording of the 1857 version of Verdi's masterpiece, Simon Bocanegra. Over the next 40 minutes or so, we're going to have some conversation and we're also going to hear some singing from William Thomas singing the role of Fiesco, accompanied by Nicholas Ansdell Evans. But before we do that, I want to introduce two very special colleagues. The first is Roger Parker. Roger Parker is Opera Rara's repertoire consultant and he is also the editor of this brand new edition of the 1857 version of Simon Bocanegra that we're going to be recording next week. It is also an enormous pleasure to be joined by Sir Mark Elder. Sir Mark is the music director of the Halle here in Manchester and the Halle are old friends and collaborators with Opera Rara, having made many recordings with us over the last 10 years. Mark was also Opera Rara's artistic director between 2012 and 2019 and it's a great pleasure to welcome him back to Opera Rara to conduct this very special recording of Simon Bocanegra. So Mark and Roger over to you. Thank you, thank you very much. It's lovely to be doing this, um, this project. It's a dream come true for me. I think it is for you, Roger, too, isn't it? How long have we been talking about it? Yeah. Ten years is or so? Is it ten? As long as I that, is it? Yeah. Well, yeah. it's a piece I've actually done twice before, um, which is, in a way, counts, counts me out of being opera rara-ish. <laughs> it was one of the things that always happens with opera rara is nobody's ever done the piece before. Yeah. But now I have done it, and I've yearned to do it again in these circumstances. I've done it once in a concert and once in Covent Garden on stage. Um, just before the opera house closed. It's a, it's a piece quite separate from any other considerations about the other version. It's quite separate because it has its own integrity, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. And I think one of the, one of the ways, the thought experiment of doing it is thinking how it sits in Verdi's life at that time, Les Verbes Sicilienne, you know, French grand opera before it, and Un Ballo et Mascara after it. And, you couldn't imagine more difference between it and those, those other works. He's constantly experimenting. And this is an experimental work, isn't it? Really? Oh, isn't absolutely it? it is. And I find that fascinating, working on it again for the third time and thinking about what Verdi wanted to do in the various operas at this period. Many people, and I'm really one of them, believe that his greatest single achievement was the three middle period operas. Rigoletto, mm. Il Trovatore and La Traviata. And in those three works, he, he got the balance between the, the word and the note perfect, didn't he? Yeah. One should be able to understand every word of the libretto. The, the music is, is honed to fit the situation absolutely pithily, not one mm. note too many. And Bocanegra came just at the end of this, didn't he? The, the, um, the Sicilian Vespers was a different sort of thing altogether, wasn't it? Yeah, he's trying to reinvent himself as a French composer with that. But yeah, there's some, this, I mean, the, you think about the creative challenge of writing Rigoletto, Trovatore and Traviata, and they, they're everywhere immediately. And they're the kind of apotheosis of his earlier works. And then, as he always does, he wants to reinvent himself in some way. He wants to reinvent this Italian tradition Yes, and it takes him some time to, to alight on this play um, about Bocanegra. He was a real man, wasn't he? Yep, yep. He was, he was there, he existed. I don't know how far. Um, it's interesting, the later version with uh, Boito's libretto, I think they knew a little bit more historical detail. I think the historical detail is fairly approximate in this version. But we're talking uh, what, about the early 14th century? Yeah, early to middle of the foot, because obviously it goes, there's a big time lapse in this opera between the prologue and the first act. But yeah, in the first half of the 14th century. So 
why, Rog, do we think that it's worth doing this? Because as we know, Boca Negra exists in a perfectly beautiful, famous, um, distinguished version with some rich, gorgeous music um, that people have been enjoying for, for decades. Why is it important, do you think, for us to do this now? Yeah, I, th I think, I mean, we've talked about this many times, but I think this first version does something unique. I don't think there's anything like it in, in Verdi's output, in the rest of Verdi's output. And there is a sense in which he's tried, this is, this is a kind of, it's in some ways, it's the most avant-garde he became in some way. You know, there's, there's a huge amount of recitative in it. There's an even more shocking for the, for, the, for the audience of the time. There are a huge number of things which seem like arias, but they're just people declaiming on one note all the time. He's, he's, he's almost, he's going, he's trying to forget about those, those great operas of the early 50s and do something different, which, I mean, we've talked about it. It's, it's better described as music theater in some ways than it is opera. Well, one of his greatest characteristics all through his life was his will, his, in, his enthusiasm to follow his path. And I feel that his ruthlessness as a creative artist comes to the fore in this work. He doesn't make many concessions to popular taste, very few. And there are many things about this work that would have mitigated against it being a success. He must have foreseen it. He must have been wondering whether or not the public would get it. It was yeah. a Venetian premiere, wasn't it? Yeah, and he, um, you know, it, it's very interesting because he writes a whole number of letters after it. It's not a success when it's first put on. And um, there's a rather, you might say, there's a sort of theatrical flair in the way that he describes how it was such a fiasco. Um, and what he says is that the, the, the usual choice of words he's saying that he thinks it's at least as good as some of the operas which became very, which had become very famous. Um, but the audience did not choose to follow him on his journey. I think that's more or less what he's saying, that the audience were expecting something they didn't get. But he must have known that that would be the result because an Italian audience in the middle of the 19th century yeah. was quite you know, definite about what it expected and how it was going to be entertained and what, what are the sort of things that it would like. Yeah. Melodies and a certain amount of vocal, vocal virtuosity, some yeah. excitement. But this piece is, is different, isn't it? It's very dark. Yeah, um, it's very dark, very dependent uh, on the words. It's a very wordy opera in all sorts of ways. Um, I mean, he periodically during his life, he talked about this. There's a famous letter where he talks about um, that he'd always wanted to write his own libretti. You know, he'd always wanted to control every aspect of operatic creation. And I mean, he's constantly bullying his librettist into getting precisely the kind of words he wants. And this is this, there's something about, I mean, I think one of the most interesting things is that Verdi could never start writing music until he had an entire libretto. You know, he was sketching out, and there's some way in which, in which he's thinking about this opera as a dramatic statement before it becomes a musical one. Yes, that's really interesting. I'd never thought about that. I, I think you're absolutely right. But what you're really describing, Rod, surely, is his determination in writing a new score to find eventually the musical language for it that will give it its distinctive character, its yeah. distinctive color. Yeah. He called it a tinter, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. And the tinter of this work is, is affected surely by the fact that it's a seaside opera. The sea yeah. is never far away. Exactly, and also I think the other the other aspect, the sea is there, but it's also darkness. You know, the play of light in the opera is very important. And large numbers of scenes happen, you know, just before dawn or just as night is coming. And the famous, without doing a spoiler, there's a famous effect in the last scene where the lights gradually go out 
as the main character dies. And uh, so this, yeah, this play of physical light on stage is sort of echoed by the colors that are in the orchestra and what he, what he gets out of that. And he responded to that so creatively, so imaginatively. And the audience felt being, that they were, I think, were being pushed away. Yeah. One of the most extraordinary things that he's prepared to compromise on is the fact that the central character, Simon Bocanegra himself, a pirate who became the first doge of Genoa, doesn't have any arias. Yeah. I mean, that's remarkable, isn't it? it? It really is. And I think what's also remarkable is that this could only happen because, in a sense, because Verdi had written Trovatore and Traviata, because he had such prestige at that point, he could get the singers he wanted and say, oh, by the way, you don't have an aria. You know, it's a difficult ask. Right, Who was the major. first baritone then? There was an, a, a guy called Giraldoni, and he was famous. And uh, he, but Verdi's prestige persuaded him. But he was also, Verdi was always interested, particularly in these baritones who were singing actors. You know, he always talked about diction and those, and those things. And this, this opera is full. It's full of dark voices, isn't it? It's full of that. that what, you know, no female roles? One female role. And uh, it's particularly interesting in that way that, um, and there are, I mean, you, you know, what, one of the things that's difficult to negotiate in this opera is when there's a single female role, how that works in ensembles and what, what's required of the female role. Yes, because all the male, male roles are down lower yeah. and they get really low, don't they, in order to get them all in. Yeah. Yeah. But he, he knew he was doing something that people would feel challenged by or disappointed by or would misunderstand. Yeah. And I think, that he, I think that he risked it because, of, as you say, his prestige was so remarkable after Rigoletto and Traviato, though, though yeah. that had a sticky start in the, yeah, yeah. In the same theatre, yeah. didn't it? Yeah. And Trovatore was such a, once it got going, you know, it was a huge yeah. popular yeah. success, wasn't it, all over the world. And it, it, it was as if he wanted to do something a little different. He yeah. wanted to change the form, change the, the bowl into which he poured all his uh, yeah. musical ideas. Yeah. And um, I love it. I think yeah. it's a very, very fine opera, yeah. this yeah. opera. Yeah. I also love the later one. Yeah. But we shouldn't think about that, I think. Yeah. I think what we want everybody to, to consider is that this work stands on its own feet. And that what he did 25 years later by looking at it again, and I believe he looked at every single bar. And sometimes yeah. he left them, and yeah. sometimes he made a tiny change, and sometimes he made huge changes, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes he tore the pages out of the manuscript yeah. and started to write something completely different. Yeah. So that whole process is completely separate, and it gives us a, a completely separate experience. What I think I'm enjoying so much about doing this, and I hope we can communicate with the public, is that given its own integrity, its own sense of wholeness, that everything in it belongs together. Whereas there are pages of it, the numbers and melodies, that later on, 25 years later, don't sit so well with the music that he wrote then in, in the, yeah. beginning of the 18, beginning of the 1880s. And I think this work has a, a validity and a power and a speed, I think that's important, yeah, yeah. a sense of pre, you know, pressing forward that is really Verdian. I don't think it needs any apology making for it at all. No. Of course, it's hard to sing. Yeah. It's hard to act. It's hard to declaim. Yeah. And I think your point about it being a wordy opera is, is, is very well made. I mean, I, I, I don't know whether there are more words than there are in, in Trovatore, but it's the way the words come across to the public that is so yeah, different, isn't yeah. it? When a composer sets, you know, two or three sentences on one note with the various rhythms, it's to throw the concentration of the listener onto the word, isn't it? Yeah. And onto the meaning of the word and the implication of the word, rather than to enjoy the melody. Yeah. And he does yeah. that quite a lot, doesn't he? He does. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's see if we can illustrate that with a musical example. We have uh, one, of the, one of the very few things that you could call an aria, yes? A short one, yeah. very famous one, instantly recognizable. Bases of all ages 
and all countries sing all it all stripes. the time. Yeah, yeah. So despite the fact this opera not being so well known, this aria certainly is. Yeah. And it comes at the beginning of the of the opera, doesn't it? In yeah. the prologue. The prologue, and it's a a man whose daughter has just unexpectedly died, and it's a kind of lament for her, an angry lament. Um, you know, bemoaning the loss and also angry about the circumstances in which she died. Yes, she lost her virginity. She had a lover who, who, who took advantage of her. Yeah. And he's very, very angry about that. And of course, he's going to miss her. And this man is one of the most senior members of the community in Genoa, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, he's a patrician. A patrician. Yeah. Yeah. Um, from a famous family, the yeah. Fieschi. And this is Fiesco's lament for the, for the incredibly unfortunate death of his daughter, Maria. So let's hear Will and Nicholas.
What an extraordinary piece that is, isn't it? Yes, yeah. it's very famous, isn't it? It's very familiar. There must be people all over the world who think, oh yeah, well I know that. And it's a lovely example of such a beautiful tune that you might think belongs in the later version, mm -hmm. but actually it was there right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. As so many of the most beautiful things in the, in the work are. They were there right yeah. at the start, yeah. part of the initial conception, and perhaps, you know, played with a bit, changed a bit, embroidered, I don't know, uh, adjusted to mm. suit taste. Yeah. That's important, yeah. isn't it, Rod? I, you know, what I'm reminded of <clears throat> um, with this opera more and more is, I, I can't remember, Verdi was writing to some librettist or other and said, a good librettist must always know when not to write poetry and a good opera composer must know when not to write music. And there's something about the spareness of this opera, isn't there? There's not, that there's not a, uh, I mean, and one of the things that we've had many conversations about over the years is because the words are so condensed here, it's working out, you know, precisely how the, in realistic terms, you know, what's happening. And it can be worked out, but it's elliptical sometimes because it's just this concentration on the moment, on the dramatic moment. And the music's like that too, isn't it? Absolutely, focused and concentrated and um, not wanting to get distracted by too much detail. Mm -hmm. It's a very hard, one must say this, it's a very hard libretto to describe, to talk about, to, to carry out um, into, into people's minds who've never heard it. And I, my advice is to everybody is not to worry. Oh. If, if you can't quite sort out what the details of the action are, don't worry too much about it, don't fret, but go for the, the, the personalities and the way that the principal characters interlock with each other and how the musical, um, the musical expressions come from the situations rather than from the details, the backstories, as yeah, it were. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. No, absolutely. You just, uh, it's there. I mean, he, he didn't, he didn't care about those things be because of this, this kind of austerity really that's going on. And this austerity means a concentration on the most important things in the opera. And often they're not, you know, the most important moments in terms of the words, are not coloured by elaborate musical ideas, are they? Some of the, you know, the, with this famous expression of Verdi's, which often people talk about the parola scenica, you know, which is, which is often coincides with some great musical revelation. But here it's not, it's not like that always, is it? That the, the most important words just come in the sparest of recitative. Yes, that's, that's so true. And I think that that makes it a modern piece, you see. I think that makes yeah. it a piece for our time. Um, that it has great emotional musical power, but it, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't go away from the idea that the drama needs to be raw, that it needs to be bare and lean. Yeah. And Verdi understood how to write that himself in his music. Yeah. And then, if you have that atmosphere, with so many scenes played out with rather simple vocal phrases, but very powerful words. I think the words are wonderful. Yeah. One must say that. Yeah. I think old Piave did, did him a great job. And, and Verdi wrote that he did. I mean, they yeah. got criticism and he said he quoted a few lines from, from this libretto and said how beautiful they were. Yes, yeah. I think the, the, the libretto is very, very strong. And Verdi was right to set it in the way that he did. But I think it, the result is, that you get this, the balance of the word and the note uh, in a particularly fresh way. Yeah. And the darkness and uh, gloom and unhappiness that they found uh, in 1851, and they weren't quite sure what to make of it. Uh, now we can enjoy it for what it, what it, what it is. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. There's a, you've read, there's a, a famous book written about Verdi, the first book of musical analysis, if you want, of Verdi, written by this character called Bazzevi. And the last opera is Simon Boccanegra, because he wrote it in, uh, in 1858. And, and, and it, it just, he doesn't understand it. He doesn't understand it. And what he says about Simon Boccanegra is, we can obviously, this is Verdi's fourth manner, you know, it's different from everything else before. And he shows himself to be a follower of Wagner. 
Yeah. Uh, I don't really know whether he knew much Wagner at that point, but that just means that he was doing something not Italian. Abstruse. Was, yeah. 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 Strange, and we're not used to this. Yeah. So it probably means yeah. he's interested in Wagner. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. of course, th at that time, that absolutely wasn't the case. No. But it shows us now, uh, that for people coming to this work for the first time, that, mm. that they all regarded it with some astonishment and yeah. surprise. And some people were, were, were dismissive of it, thought he'd lost yeah. his way. And yeah. other people said, well, I think we need to listen to it more than once in, in order to pass judgment on it. Yeah. One of the things I would say about it that, that is easy to overlook that is there is an exquisite delicacy and originality in some of the harmonies. Yeah. Uh, more, that I would say, than in Tramiata or Trovatore. Absolutely. The, yeah. there's, there's some piquant qualities yeah. in the way these lines are set. There are some great surprises yeah. uh, in the way the music falls on the ear yeah. in the midst of all this dark gloom. Yeah. And, um, and that, of course, is like a, a musical light shining in the darkness. It's very, I mean, I think one of the things in which you could get yeah, Wagnerian in inverted commas, but one of the things that very often happens, we talked about this, that the way you expect melody, you get the singers just declaiming on a single line but very often there's a lot of intricate action going on in the orchestra, isn't there? Little tiny, little, yeah. little elaborate motives and things and colors that emerge as accompaniments to aria. Right, so he would knew that he, he wasn't finding it difficult to invent tunes. Oh, no. you know, I don't think he ever had a problem with that. No. And his last five or six years, he'd poured tunes out of his pen, didn't he? I mean, yeah. all those earlier operas, just wonderful. Yeah. But he, he was making a choice yeah. to, be, to have this slight, this slight um, what you'd say, like going back, not, not giving the public the richness and fullness that they would have expected, but yeah. it's rather underdone. And yeah. yet the result is beautiful. Yeah, I think it's also, we, we've talked about this before, but it's probably quite significant that while the opera wasn't a great success when it was first performed and generally didn't do the rounds. There were one or two places where it really had an effect. And one of them was in Reggio Emilia of all places and one was in Naples. And in both cases, Verdi supervised the performance. And, you know, in the case of both there, he was there for a month. You know, so it wasn't just he, he came along and put the chef's sauce on or anything like that. He was working with the singers yeah. from the very first day. And it must be something to do with that, don't you think? Why Absolutely. Think, yeah. it, that recognises its special quality. And it's what we've been doing here yeah, exactly. for the last very, week yeah. with our wonderful cast, um, trying to bring everybody together so that everybody will have the same feeling for the piece, yeah. the same attitude towards the nature of the piece and how we must interpret it because it needs it. Yeah. I mean, the other thing Verdi said was, in The Force of Destiny, the characters are ready-made for you. In yeah. Simon Bocanegra, you have to make them yourself. Yeah, I think with the, this whole rehearsal period that, uh, that, that uh, you've been doing, I think anyone sort of dropping in and, and attending one of these rehearsals would be surprised that most of the discussion is about the words. It's Absolutely. almost as if, you know, there are beautiful vocal sounds coming out, but that's, that's not what gets talked about most of the time. What's talked about is the words. Absolutely, and their power and how to make them live. Yeah. But uh, Roger, I think it's important to stress that because so many people are aware that Simon Bocanegra is a great, beautiful, rich opera with much music from towards the end of his life, and that's the one everybody mm. knows, is what we're doing a dry academic exercise. And you and I want to say yeah. really confidently and loudly, absolutely not. Yeah. This is a work that stands on its own two feet. Yeah, um, and I, I, would, I, I really am convinced that you, you cannot say that you know Verdi unless you know this piece. I mean, it's an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary experiment on his part that he never really went back to, you know, and to understand this moment. It's a very dark moment in Italian history as well. You know, the revolution sort of failed and it's a dark kind of depressed time 
in the 1850s. And there's something of that in there as well. Yeah, isn't that interesting? But then why did he want to tinker with it uh, at all and then end up doing something so profoundly different? Because for the people who, who hear what we're going to do, knowing the later version, as many yeah. people will, um, they will be astonished how 10 minutes, 15 minutes of music go by and they don't know a note of it. Yes. And then they'll yeah. find 10 minutes that they know very well. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, the result of this is by doing it as he originally wrote it, you're putting the bits that you know from the later version yeah. into the right context. Exactly. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, the, it, it's, it's also very surprising because a lot of the music, when it was written in 1857, was very, very modern. It sounds modern. You, That's you, what we can't I mean, cope. the number of times we've been thinking about moments, you know, this week, which sound like Otello, or they, you know, there's all sorts of, with this quirky orchestration and things that, yeah, that, that look forward. That's right. So it's, it, it, it's an extraordinary experience to put it back into its time. Yes, I think one listens differently. And, and that's what's so exciting about the, the, the concept of this whole project with Opera Rara is to be able to open everybody's ears, everybody's hearts, yeah. and to listen in a new way. Yeah. And, um, and thereby realize that there's, there's a piece by Verdi that we didn't know. Yes, exactly. Really. Yeah, because the exactly. bits we recognize will feel different in the context yeah. in which he originally designed them. No, no, absolutely. Yeah. So I think we're, we're, we're running time is against us. Uh, Henry, you were going to field some questions for us, if there are any. That's right. Um, uh, well, uh, there are two questions which have come up during the course of the conversation. Um, I think the first is around how would you describe the style of singing in this earlier 1857 version of Simon Bocanegra? Well, it's two things to me. It's old fashioned in a way in that some of the writing, particularly for the soprano and the tenor, um, are full of the sort of vocal gestures that people would have ex expected and would have got over the, the previous 30 years mm -hmm. with Verdi and indeed with Donizetti and his um, contemporaries. Um, and that can be instanced by the first appearance of the soprano which is a wonderful part. She's a very courageous, modern woman. But when we first see her, she's a young girl recently left a convent, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and we see her by herself singing um, for her own enjoyment and for her own love. And the style of that music is very different from what it became when he'd finished revising it. Mm -hmm. And indeed, she has a cabaletta of prodigious athleticism and um, it's very difficult to do. And it's one of the things he first took away in 1880 when he thought he'd have another go at the opera. And that's something that looks back as it were. Yeah, I think uh, the, the soprano part is, is almost, it was, it was written for a woman who made her living singing Lady Macbeth and Abigaile in Nabucco. But also you need, you need that that kind of forceful soprano, but also one who can sing Traviata as well. I mean, it's a, so it's an enormously demanding role actually in all sorts of ways because it requires so many aspects, different aspects. Right, and yet it, it's a young girl. She's very charming and very brave. Yeah, yeah. and that, that, the, it's, that's very interesting. I mean, it's the one thing that's different about Verdi's sopranos. There are so many of them who have strong wills. Yeah, there's so many of them who, you know, are like that. And uh, um, yeah, there, there are there are sort of unique challenges there. Yes, um, there are, yeah. But the other thing about the, the style of singing, I think that is, is very important to emphasize is a lot of it is very syllabic, that, that it's one note for one syllable. And th this gives the impression of constant declamation and as we've been describing, sometimes rather mon monotonous, and I don't mean that in a critical way, but as a descriptive way, and, but other times very passionate and very um, forthright, but not with much virtuosity. The tenor has a very great scene all to himself mm. Mm. Uh, in, in this opera, 
which is very demanding, but it doesn't have, um, it doesn't look back in any way. It doesn't have melisma at all, really. No, no. Not significantly. Yeah. Um, and I think that's part of the, the character that is particular to Bocanegra, this forthright delivery, passionate, full of character, full of variety, but strikingly um, centered and ruthless. And in, lean. Lean. Lean, that's right, yeah. yeah. And that'll come yeah. in the orchestra too, how they must yeah. play. Yeah. Fabulous. Um, a second question, and I think this comes from the fact that relatively rarely or uniquely you've actually conducted a performance of this earlier 1857 version of the opera. Uh, and the question which has come in is, what for you are the challenges of conducting this piece? Well, finding the line through it. Uh, each opera Verdi needs its own line, its own understanding, and each opera is different. It has music in it that is particular for that opera, and it comes from his involvement with the libretto and the, the background, the, the, the place, the landscape, if you like, of the opera. And uh, in Bocanegra, we have the sea. Um, Genoa was a great port in those days, just as much as it was in Berdi's day. And the sea is very, very near because Bocanegra came from the sea and he wants to go back there. And one of the things that the conductor has to do is, is to enjoy that and make that come out and make it really um, the lilt of the music be felt by everybody. But there are, there are the other aspects about it that are still really hard uh, in Verdi because he's very demanding. And that is to make all the little things fit into one line. It, and you, have to, you have to invent quite a lot of the speeds here, don't you? There's a lot of you know, recitativo, where it's your decision, how pressed or, or right. relaxed. It is. So you're, you're making that rhythm in a way that in Trovatore, for example, you don't, you know, it's not so complicated in that way. No, the choices in, in Bocanegra are, are huge. Mm. The scenes play out in a very, very um, uh, varied way. And, um, and I think that, uh, well, I think that one has to, Involvement, one has to study the score. One has to study the text to find the line through it, you know? Mm. Um, that's not easy. I've been thinking about it for years. Mm. The first time I did this piece, when was it? It was way before. Late, late 90s? Yeah, in the late yeah. 90s, yeah. And I remember thinking how, how strange it is, how, um, how unusual it is, and how does one make this have a, have a sense of wholeness one has to say, you see, that each act in an opera is one piece of music. It's not a series of little gestures and an occasional tune. The audience must feel that from the moment we start an act to the moment the curtain comes down, we have done one piece of music. And that's very, very difficult to do when there is so much variety and so much changing of pace and mm. atmosphere. Mm. But it is possible. And it's one of the things we've been rehearsing with the singers this week, yeah. isn't it? How to keep the line, how to keep the excitement of the, the music there and keep the drama allied to the music. That's very hard. And the, the last act in that sense is really extraordinary, isn't it? Because it just is one number really, you know, yes. and huge amount of variety within it. But it, there's, the, you know, there's, there are no double bars. <laughs> it's That's just right. All the way through. On it goes. Yeah. Full of variety. Though. Yeah. It's a, it's a great challenge, but it's so exciting, and I'm so thrilled. I think we all are to be engaged on this project and to try and find a way to, to bring it alive. And of course, what we're dying for is for everybody to say, well, I thought I knew Bocanegra, but now I do. Yeah. Fantastic. That feels like a very good point at which to bring this very fascinating and engaging discussion um, to uh, a close. Um, so I want to end by thanking William Thomas and Nicholas Ansdell Evans, both for singing and playing so beautifully. Um, and of course, I want to add my thanks to Roger and Mark for the generosity of their time, but also their insights for what I think by 
any standards is a really compelling and fascinating project that we're going to do here. We are roughly halfway through our rehearsal process. Um, and on uh, Wednesday, we begin our studio recording right here at Halle St. Peter's, when we will be joined not just by the Halle Orchestra, but also by our friends at the Opera North Chorus, with whom we are also collaborating. And it's a, the, the beginning of a studio recording is always an incredibly exciting event because, as always at Opera Rara, we say to ourselves with a mixture of trepidation but also excitement, this is something that we are doing for the very, very first time. We complete the recording on the uh, 16th of April, and then two days later, we will present this 1857 version of Simon Bocanegra in this new edition by Roger Parker uh, at Bridgewater Hall in concert. And I would encourage those of you who are able to, to make the effort to come to that because I really believe it's going to be a very unique and very special experience. There are still tickets available and they can be found either at the Halle website or also at the Bridgewater Hall uh, website. We finish our recording, we go into a period of post-production and we aim to release this recording uh, in uh, the autumn of 2025, which is going to be a very exciting event. But for now, thank you again to Mark and to Roger, to William and to Nicholas, and thank you so much to all of you for making the time to join us for this discussion. Thank you.